Okay, we are here to recap the Pepperberg study about an African gray parrot who demonstrates that he could comprehend the concepts of same and different. And he does this by talking. Of course, parrots are special in that they can produce many human sounds. Um, I start off this topic by asking, what is the motivation for a parrot to talk? Why do they talk? This is not really a question that's addressed in the study, but it kind of is implied in our research into the learning approach. Do animals make human sounds because they have been conditioned to do so, or is it more about social learning? And this harkens back to the main uh, assumptions of the approaches. Uh, the learning approach in particular has to do with behavior modification. And that could be accomplished two ways according to our syllabus. One is through conditioning. That includes, of course, operant and classical conditioning. Or, as Bandura pointed out, it could be also gained through modeling, i.e. social learning. So hopefully, by this point, late in the semester, most of you have a grasp for the difference between operant conditioning and classical conditioning. And in schools, Fortunately or unfortunately, we tend to use more operant conditioning because classical conditioning is more of a biological uh, association and it's almost impossible to uh, inflict learning onto students by using biological means. Let's go past this. Just keep this in mind again that you will be asked in all likelihood on one of these exams coming up to describe assumptions of one of the four approaches. Okay. And when you use examples, of course, you could use examples of things you have learned or just classic examples from history, such as Pavlov's dogs or B.F. Skinner's Skinner boxes. All right, let's actually get into the study. And I'm going through some of these slides rather quickly, um, so feel free to pause, of course, and stare at stuff. Okay, so we want to see if a parrot can acquire the concept of same or different. Now, keep in mind that language and communication are two separate phenomena. Of course, animals communicate. You could tell when your dog is happy, you could tell when he wants to eat, uh, dogs are barking to each other all the time, but is this actual language? The answer is probably no, but language itself has to be distinguished as something where there's some sort of arbitrary representation of something. So in other words, language is symbolic. So if I say the word tree, and you never heard English before, an image of a tree should not be conjured into your head. Most language does not capture what you are saying through its sound. Okay, so language largely is symbolic. There's an argument that when you're a child, that you don't recognize necessarily that language is symbolic, but you make sounds in the hopes that you will be rewarded for those sounds. So for example, if a child says, I want milk, and then all of a sudden you have milk, then you're going to associate milk with getting milk. So that's more about conditioning. All right, so I'll say one word, um, and then I get that word. Is it the same for Alex? Or is there actually some genuine thinking and construction of meaning going on here. Speaking of construction of meaning, um, in the background of the study, Pepperberg does mention uh, some big names in research, which include Bandora, because we are looking at social learning, and she also mentions uh, David Primack, uh, who had done lots of research with primates in showing that they could understand newly constructed arbitrary symbolic language. Um, so, for example, here we see a chimpanzee who is able to comply with requests based on symbolic representations. Okay, this is just some background. I'm not sure how much of this you want. You could just skip ahead if you find this stuff kind of tedious. Uh, I think some of it is interesting from a philosophical point of view or just like a thought experiment point of view. There's a famous thought experiment called the Chinese Room which actually has to do mostly with artificial intelligence. If uh, you're interested in AI, you might encounter this thought experiment that talks about um, is language, uh, is the production of language actually a demonstration of understanding or is it just a demonstration of programming? Uh, so for example, 
in this famous thought experiment, a person inside of a box uh, gets questions, goes to a book, finds the answer, and then outputs the answer. And then the person outside of the box thinks, oh, wow, this person really understands me. But again, it might just be programming. One of the things about the study is we really want to make sure that Alex the parrot, who you'll meet in a few moments, has not been programmed, that this is an actual uh, demonstration of intelligence. Okay, so let's talk about the participant who you probably know is an African gray parrot. There are other things you can know about him. He's been trained since 1977. So that might be important to keep in mind to realize that this is a longitudinal study and that many of the things that he has acquired over time uh, didn't necessarily happen within a short distance of the publication of the article. So this is published 10 years later in 1987. We want to know things, for example, like how well he lives his life, how awesome his cage is, how much food he has, because we want to be able to ensure that this is an ethical study by the guidelines uh, for animal ethics. And we'll come to that much later in the video. But knowing the dimensions of the cage might be useful, knowing what kind of food or what kind of seed, uh, some of this I can't even pronounce, but so, for example, knowing that he was given uh, free access standardly, standardly, <laughs> he had standard access to sunflower seeds, dried corn, etc. Again, this ensures that we are being ethical. And since the 1970s, there have been some very strict guidelines on animal ethics. Uh, but more importantly, Alex is special because he is able to make vocal requests. He's able to communicate principally with his trainer. So he is owned by Pepperberg. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. He's uh, cared for by Pepperberg, and therefore this is an opportunity sample, just like as if you were uh, raising a dog and you used that dog in an experiment. That would be a uh, moment of opportunity. Okay, so again, why is it important to know the cage dimensions? Well, we're ensuring that he has a big enough cage, and he's not even there 24-7. He's only really there during the nighttime or during sleeping hours. You can learn a lot about Alex just by simply doing a Google search or looking at Wikipedia. Interestingly enough, um, his Wikipedia page is actually longer than some other famous animals, such as the chimpanzee who went to space, the first chimpanzee in space. So apparently talking, um, making a few vocal requests is much more noteworthy than just you know involuntarily being shot into space. So Alex is quite the celebrity. But one thing that really impresses me about Alex, and this is actually in the primary source, is learning some of the ways that he learned some of the colors he could identify. So for example, one interesting um, thing of note is that he learned the color gray by looking in a mirror and asking what color Alex. And um, Pepperberg then taught him the word gray, which is kind of, amazing because then you realize that Alex is not just inquisitive but he's also maybe self-aware maybe he's even like a little bit like has existential concerns um, so I don't know if I'm taking that too far but I like Alex I like people that ask questions I wish my students asked more questions please ask questions below I'll be happy to answer all right so Alex the parrot is um, very capable and he could say things very clearly. Uh, some phonemes, some things he can't pronounce as well. We'll talk about that later. I encourage you to go to um, YouTube and look at some video of Alex in action making some identifications. I don't want to play it here because I don't know if I'll get a copyright strike if I were to do that. All right, let's get into the aim and procedure. So we could actually go to the primary source itself to read the aim. Um, the present study was therefore undertaken to see if an avian subject, the aforementioned African gray parrot, could use vocal labels to demonstrate symbolic comprehension 
of the concepts of same and different. That's a bit long for an aim. So we could just clean that up a little bit. Um, avian subject meaning, you know, a bird species. And why did they specify bird species? Well, as we saw in the background, a lot of the studies that had to do with animals and language usually would use primates. Um, very rarely were non-primates, uh, non-monkey-like animals used. Um, so for example, I know in the 60s and 70s, some people try to communicate with dolphins. Um, sometimes you get some communication with uh, various other species like whales, but usually it's a primate. So the study is to see if like a non-primate can demonstrate comprehension of concepts such as same or different. Okay, moving forward. All right, uh, I just put this slide here to scare people. Don't worry about that. All right, keep in mind that Alex was used in a lot of experiments and he had been working with Pepperberg since 1977. So he already comes into this study with a bit of knowledge and he's going to accrue more vocabulary as it moves forward. So this is a longitudinal study, meaning this study takes place over years. So therefore, we need to know what his baseline is and then kind of realize that he's going to grow from that baseline. So coming into the experiment or, or the study, he already knew five colors, four shapes, and four materials. And the four materials he knew were paper, wood, rawhide, and cork. Now, we have three concepts that he's going to be tested on rather than two, and later we could figure out why it's important that we have three concepts rather than two when we get to something later on called the probe questions. Okay, the beginning of the study does go back to what we just talked about a little bit uh, a little while ago about what is true language. And again, keep reminding yourself that language is something that's arbitrary and it's symbolic. And I'm going to come back to a similar slide later, so let's move forward. But it's not just about language, it's also about understanding how to group things together through concepts. You'll often see these kind of things in sort of like intelligence uh, testing with children especially, are they able to connect things conceptually? Are they able to form relational concepts? So for example, in the first row, you have eating tools. In the second, you have um, things you wear during bad weather or, or you know, to combat the weather, so clothing. Third thing is art tools, and third, the fourth thing is uh, baseball-related things. So children should have an idea on how to conceptually organize things um, through their categories. Now, there's a lot of categories here that is very difficult for a bird to express. So we're going to go a little bit easier. We're going to just test them on the concept of things that are similar and things that are different. And again, IQ testing or intelligence testing that's designed for children often ask children what's same, what's different. And it depends on the age of the child. And keeping in mind that Alex's abilities are about that of a five-year-old, it's not a bad comparison to talk about Alex as if he were a child. And if you're ever asked about to make an application for the study, uh, perhaps the most plausible applications is that it may be applicable to how to teach children certain concepts. I know on past paper exam questions, they've asked about application, and quite often they've said, uh, can be used as a model for how to teach children certain types of concepts. Uh, speaking of past paper questions, there was one that was particularly challenging. Um, there's a small excerpt in the study about how it takes four steps for Alex to process information. And you could know this. Uh, you could pause it and look at it. Uh, essentially, it just means he's got a attend to multiple characteristics or aspects of objects, then he has to figure out what the question being asked of him actually is. Is he being asked, are the objects same or are they different, or how are they different, excuse me, and how are they the same? Then he has to work out the cognition, like what is actually same and what's actually different. And then he actually has to formulate a vocal response. Okay, let's get into the good stuff. Let's get into the actual procedure. 
So the procedure is sort of threefold because two thirds of it has to do with the training procedures, how he learned various uh, labels and then how he learned to distinguish same and different. So training comes in two phases. All right, the early training is for label acquisition. And I've created this flow chart to help students understand the possible directions that this training could take. First of all, we should know that like Bandora, this learning is based on social learning, not conditioning. We don't want conditioning to be too much of a factor here. Why not? Because any animal can be conditioned. You can condition your dog to sit, you can condition a seal to jump through a hoop, and you can even condition animals to imitate human sounds without actually understanding what those sounds mean. Just go to YouTube and you'll see talking dogs and talking cats through their barking and meowing. That's not important. What's important is that we have real social learning. In order to have social learning take place, we need to actually have a model. And strangely enough, the model is a human. So you have a trainer asking a human very easy questions. And it looks like real training. But what you really want to happen is you want the bird to feel a little bit jealous and to be a little bit competitive with the human. Now, what would be his motivation for interrupting the two humans? Well, first of all, he's seeing that the human will gain objects if he or she is able to get the correct answer. So if that person is able to give correct labels, that person will be positively reinforced with the items themselves. Now, Alex is sort of a hoarder. He likes to collect things. So he's very incentivized to interrupt and to get things right. But we want him to interrupt. That's the whole purpose of the model rival training. However, if the model does not get it right, she is going to be shown disapproval, or Alex will be shown disapproval. What does disapproval actually mean? We're not quite sure. That's what it says in the primary source. So that's the early training. So once we have the labels, then we can go into the later training, which is for the concept of same and different. Very similar in that the last two have to do with either gaining something or being reprimanded in some way. Now, disapproval is sort of a lighter version of, uh, I guess you could say kind of punishment, but this person here is now going to be scolded if she gets it wrong or if Alex gets it wrong. Let's go in the correct order, first of all. So now the questions are not, what is it? What matter? What shape? What color? Now it's, what's the same? What's the difference? Or, I'm sorry, what's different? And now we have the conceptual training of this idea of same and different. You could say three things. You could say color, shape, or matter. Or in Alex's case, color, shape, or mama. Apparently he had a hard time forming the sounds to say matter. So they've settled on him saying mama as a plausible um, pronunciation of matter. So that's the second training. Then the last third of the procedure is the test itself. And here we now have two trainers involved. Um, one is looking away, and that's the principal trainer, and she's looking at the wall. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. Then we have a secondary trainer who is now testing Alex. The secondary trainer has never trained Alex on this particular task. And both of these aspects are important because it's going to help keep the validity of the subject, or sorry, the study intact. The items presented could be things Alex has seen before. These are familiar items. Or they could include one or two new things that he's never seen before. These are called novel items. If it corrects, again, he gets to keep them. So again, he is incentivized to get it correct. Now, if he's incorrect, it's much more standardized. So the trainer would say no, then he or she would turn his head, and then they would begin a correction procedure to make sure Alex uh, could get another chance at it, okay? Try to learn from his mistakes. 
Now, why is the trainer facing away? Well, very simple. Um, you want to avoid cueing. All right? You don't want to have any sort of like non uh, or, or nonverbal expressions or some sort of body language indicate when Alex is right or wrong. And sometimes this actually happens by accident. Um, so yeah, there's an, uh, you want to avoid experimenter bias, but you also want to avoid uh, accidental cues. And accidental cues apparently are a real thing. Uh, there's a famous example from the 19th century of a horse who uh, could do math, apparently. So you would ask him, like, what was the square root of 16? He would uh, stomp his hoof four times, and then he would stop, and people would think, oh my god, this horse knows math. But apparently what was happening was if the person asking the question knew the answer, then he would give away the answer by acting delighted or surprised once the answer was hit. So in other words, once the four was cue, was stomped, then the horse would see a cue from the person who would ask the question and he would stop. So he was actually responding more to body language than to the actual math question. Now, of course, the horse didn't know math, but it's still pretty impressive because that means the horse did have some sort of intelligence and that he could read people so well. So what is cueing? Cueing simply is giving nonverbal signals to get a desired behavior, especially from an animal in this case. Okay, so again, in the graphic, the principal trainer is turned away, mainly to avoid cueing. So why is she there at all? Well, her main purpose is to sort of be a translator for Alex, because she knows Alex's responses better probably than the secondary trainer. So for example, in the case of Mama, she'll be able to confirm it as matter. So she's there as a way to check that the answers are what they claim or what she knows them to be. All right, one additional thing that is confusing for a lot of students, and you, know, you might wanna take some time to um, stay with this last point about the procedures or the testing, is that Alex was also asked questions where there was more than one correct answer. Now, why is that? Well, we want to make sure he's actually attending to the questions. What does that actually mean? That he's actually listening to what's being asked of him. So for example, if I showed him a block of wood that was blue and a block of wood that was red, well, there's only one difference. And so he might just be looking at it rather than hearing what we're saying. And he might say, oh, well, all I have to say is color and I'll get my reward. But sometimes we're gonna change the formula. We usually ask similarity or difference if there's one similarity or one difference. We usually don't do it if there are two similarities or two differences. So in other words, we're gonna say, hey, what's the same? And then he should say color. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> he should say matter or shape, okay? So again, the probes is mainly there as a check to see that he's actually listening. It's, it, this helps increase the validity if he gets these ones correct. And surprise, surprise, he's gonna get a lot of these ones correct. He's actually gonna do better on these than he does on the regular ones. Okay, so let's get into some numbers. And um, the unfortunate thing about Cambridge is that sometimes they want numbers. Me personally, I like to say what's bigger, what's smaller, make comparisons, but some questions may require some numbers. Um, I'm not sure why I have this here actually. I'm just reminding you that um, it was a longitudinal study. It took a few months uh, to actually form new phonemes, phonemes being units of sound. Um, as we talked about before, matter is a hard thing for him to say and they spent much time nine months in total trying to him to get him to say matter. All right, let me just skip this all together. You could pause and look at this if you want to, but I want to move forward. Uh, results, okay. I'd like to keep the results as simple as possible. So these are just the overall numbers, okay? These are not all the numbers, but overall, 
he did better with novel items, 85%, than with familiar objects, 77%. Now that seems a little strange. You would think that if you had trained with something, you're going to do better with the thing you trained with. Think about your past paper questions. If I gave you an exam of past paper questions, you're probably gonna get more correct. But in Alex's cases, the opposite is true. And this may be surprising for some people, but for Pepperberg, it's not surprising at all. Because as we said earlier, Alex likes to collect things. He's a, a capitalist parrot. He likes shiny new things. So again, he was incentivized, not just because he's getting a reward, but he's getting a reward of something he's never seen before. So think about the earlier graphic where there was like a green car. If I was a bird, man, I'll be, all, be like all interested in getting this right so I can keep that beautiful shiny green car. I'll be the only parrot in town with a green car. So that is why, or at least that's why Pepperberg, uh, that's her theory, that he was really paying attention more to the new stuff. All right? Maybe he found the old stuff a little bit boring. So that's pretty much the results. Okay, but as I said before, that's sort of oversimplified. So let's just quickly look at the abstract for the Pepperberg study, the summary of the study. You're gonna see different numbers than the ones I just gave. First of all, I was rounding up because I, I, decimals bother me. But um, it's okay to round up as long as you say approximately or about. So you'll see here that there are actually four numbers or two sets of numbers, okay? One is for familiar, one is for novel. Why are there two sets of numbers? Well, there's a set of numbers for the first trial responses, essentially the first time he was tested on something. Then there's a number for what happened after correction procedures. So there's a low and there's a high. So rounding up most of these, 70% first trial familiar, then 77% overall familiar. Then you go to the novel, 82% first trial novel, 85% overall novel. So that's Again, two sets of numbers, two, uh, two numbers for familiar, two num numbers for novel. Okay. And there are past paper questions that have been that specific, unfortunately. And again, this is one thing I don't like about studying for the Cambridge exam. I'm not a numbers person, maybe you are, but sometimes they really want that detail. My theory about that, why they ask those kind of questions, is they need something that would differentiate like an A star from an A, and these are the kind of questions that usually do it. They need some variation in the data. Okay, there's one more set of data that we could know, and that had to do with the probes. Okay, remember, these are the questions where there were more than one answer that Alex could be saying. And again, this was, these were the ones to make sure he was paying attention to what was asked of him, not just to what he was seeing. So. He really rocked out on these, and it kind of makes sense because, I mean, the probability of being correct is higher if there are two correct answers. Um, but these are, this is great news because this means that the study probably is valid since he's doing so well, and it's beyond just chance. Uh, so first trial only, 89%, and then if you take the overall with the correction procedures, that jumps up to 90, so it's a one-point difference. Okay, you could pause it and look at it in your own time. So essentially now we have three sets of numbers, uh, overall, first trial, novel, familiar, probe. So that's six numbers in all. And uh, of course these percentages are determined by taking the total number um, correct and dividing it by the number of trials. All right, conclusions and limitations. Um, here you could pause it and read some of the verbatim primary source conclusion. Simply put, I would just say that the concept of saying different can be understood or grasped by a non-primate or an avian creature in this case. Moving forward, um, there was one other thing about the study that's kind of interesting is that initially some of the things that Alex said would be counted as wrong. And under closer inspection, it was found that sometimes the people who were recording the information didn't realize that Alex had his own special vocabulary for certain things. So uh, this is a footnote, and I might as well mention it because it's there. It was occasionally the examiner who stood corrected. So in other words, the examiner made a mistake. In about one in 20 trials, an examiner would err and uh, scold Alex for a correct response. 
Alex would repeat his correct response despite our procedures, which encouraged a lost shift strategy. And some of the examples of this would be his special personal vocabulary. Bannery for apple, truck for any sort of car, rock corn for kernel of corn uh, or dry corn, and wheat for cereal. Um, also, he called almonds cork nuts. I'm always worried that, you know, you never know if you're going to get a question about a footnote, but there it is just to cover ourselves. Also, I think it's kind of cute that he has his own, his own personal language. Okay, as per evaluation, I want to start with a point that sometimes is not easy to understand, and I'll try to make it as understandable as possible. Nowadays, a lot of psychologists, when they finish their paper, or their essay, or their research, they will point out some limitations or things that could be worked on in the future to make the study deeper or better. And one thing they said was they could have, or they could in the future one day, take it another step forward by testing Alex on his ability to use analogs. What do I mean by this? Well, you see the relationship between these items, A1, A2. Their sameness is color. Just as the sameness between B1 and B2 is also color. How you would take that to the next level is to ask Alex, is the relationship between these two items the same as the relationship of difference, I'm sorry, of sameness, excuse me, of these two items. So in other words, is he able to make analogies? In high schools, they used to teach analogies because it was part of the SAT, but essentially it's testing about relational um, concepts. So for example, um, I don't know, what's a good example? Fingers are to hands as toes are to feet. Or what's a better example? Um, gloves are to hands as socks are to feet. Something like that. So is the relationship between A1 and A2 analogous or anal uh, similar to the relationship between B1 and B2? That's all that's really saying. Again, I, I don't know how important this will be, but I just like to be as exhaustive as possible with this video. All right. Um, Moving forward to the general evaluation. Let's just go through the stuff really quickly. Uh, generalizability with a case study is usually low because case studies usually have not just one or a few participants, but usually those participants are quite special. Rather than just saying there's one bird, you could also say that there's some things that make this bird very unique. One, it's a parrot that's raised in captivity. It's not raised in the wild. Second of all, it's a very particular species, African gray parrots, does that mean other bird species or other parrots will have similar displays of learning or conceptual uh, understanding? Probably not. So generalizability is probably one of the biggest weaknesses of this study. Uh, reliability, this is in a lab under controlled conditions and there's several recipes for what happened procedurally. So I'm going to keep the rep, rep replicability or the reliability of the study pretty high. Application, as we said earlier, you could argue that the model rival technique could be applied for children. Um, I'll just stop there. I won't go much further with that. Validity, in my view, is one of the chief strengths of this study. Now, of course, things that take place in a lab are going to suffer from ecological validity. But think about all the sort of controls, all the sort of things they had done to make sure that this was real conceptual understanding of language and, and concepts of same and different. Having the person who trained Alex not facing Alex, that increases validity. Making sure that he never encountered the same combination of items twice, that increases validity. Um, what else increases validity? The probes, using the probes to make sure he's actually listening, that increases validity. So validity is quite good in my opinion. And we'll get to that on the next slide as well. So I'll hold off on that. Ethics, keep in mind when you use animals, you are applying a different standard of ethics to the animal than you would to a human. So you're not going to worry about right to withdraw the briefing informed consent. Uh, so a few slides later, we'll look at the animal ethics of this study. So as per reliability and validity, you could easily say that the recipe in the back or the sort of the list of combination of items in the back helps with both. 
So just for a few examples, um, we're going to write everything down because not necessarily because we want to replicate it. We could replicate it with another parrot in the future. Uh, so it does help replicability, but we want to make absolutely sure that we're never doing the same combination of items twice. Every combination needs to be new. So the first one, 5C WHP, 3C WHP, simply translated 5 corner pentagon, WH white, P plastic. So pentagon white plastic, triangle white plastic. There is one difference there. And since it's not a probe, we're going to ask him about difference. And the difference in this situation is shape. And the response indeed was shape. Let's do one more. Four corner RK, four corner BRK. So square red key, square brown key, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and of course, again, there's one difference. And the difference there is color. And indeed, the response was color. So this is all very well tracked. The data is quantitative, of course, which is kind of unusual for a case study. As you'll, you'll, if you learn like famous case studies in psychology, often there's a lot of qualitative, but it's a bird. All right, we're not going to ask him about his feelings and, and things of that nature. All right, moving forward. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, ethics is something that you should revisit when doing this study and Yamamoto, and. Some of this stuff will not play out uh, when we talk about most of the studies we look at in psychology. E Cambridge usually tries to look at things that are relatively ethical. So as far as like the last one, uh, mitigating pain or, or helping an animal who is suffering to the point where you actually end its misery by killing it, that's never going to come up. They might ask you specifically about things like housing, number, species and strain, reward, deprivation, and aversive stimuli. Let me just take a few of these. Um, remember that he was rewarded with the items. That was his chief incentive. You could argue that being scolded is an aversive stimuli, but his main motivating factor was not punishment. It was positive reinforcement. So that's, that's really good. Housing. He pretty much had the whole lab uh, to roam around. It was pretty much his home. He only went in his cage at night, and there he had access to food and water. Number. It's the smallest possible number. So number is really good. Uh, as far as species and strain go, um, you could mention that he was used to being in captivity, so his experience was not too stressful. Uh, replacement doesn't seem very likely. You're not going to uh, be very... It's unlikely you're going to actually be able to videotape a bird in the wild and get the same sort of understandable sounds from a wild parrot. So replacement's not even an issue here. Um, I always like to conclude the study by pointing out that there is a book called Alex and Me. It's very readable. And it's a very personal story about the relationship that developed between Pepperberg and Alex. And unfortunately, uh, he had passed away at a relatively young age uh, in his 30s. A African gray parrot usually lives to be about 50, 60 years old. So you could pause this and read this excerpt from the book um, and, you know, check out the book if you're so inclined uh, to find out more about Alex. Uh, due to his untimely death, um, Pepperberg has been kind of trying to accelerate the learning of other parrots, uh, such as one named Griffin, and there's a video on YouTube that you could watch where Griffin's intelligence is tested against preschoolers, and you could see which uh, is the smarter of the two. All right, um, it's a lot of talking. I hope it's comprehensible. I'm in a cold room right now, so I think I'm talking a little bit fast so I can get out of this cold room. I wish you the best on your examinations and in your future endeavors.